alive. And he's been a good Lord for me in my life. He's never forsaken me. And uh, thank God for him. I, man, I wish I could hold a note like that. You know. <laughs> But I can't, and I'm not going to try today. We're so blessed to be here in the house of God on the Lord's Day, and this is indeed a great Lord's Day because we're remembering what he did 2,000 years ago. At midnight last night, it was sun up in Jerusalem. At midnight, think of that, and that's this time. Uh, midnight here, sun up in Jerusalem, and that's, of course, when they went to the grave and found that he had risen Great stuff. We're going to read from Le Leviticus 23 today if you want to find that. And then we're going to settle in Deuteronomy 26. But we're going to look at this Feast of the First Fruits. We have several scriptures on the screen behind me that we'll mention. And then we'll turn to a few passages this morning as we look at this third spring feast. We studied the Passover uh, a month ago. And then we studied the Passover feast. And then we studied the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Thursday, we did the uh, Passover demonstration, and the last Sunday, we preached, uh, as we said, the, the unleavened bread, and today, we're going to look at this feast of the first fruits, and this certainly represents the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and everything the Jews did in their ceremonies all pointed to the Lord. They don't even realize it, that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in uh, the Old Testament. And uh, we know that the Jew was to offer a wave offering, or a, a, a sheaf is what they call it, to the Lord on the day after the Sabbath, which is Sunday. And that, of course, we speak of as the Feast of First Fruits because they gave their first to the Lord. The Jews set a calendar by the moon, so they had 29 and a half day months and had to make up for that with another month. Um, every once in a while they had make, make up time. But anyway, uh, as you see on the screen, Genesis 8, 4, the ark rested on the 17th day of the month. And that's the day they celebrated the first fruits that first year. And that would be uh, their, the type of the death, burial, and resurrection. And the 17th day that first year lined up certainly with the ark resting, a sign of victory. And then they changed their calendars, as you see in the next verse that uh, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, this month shall be the beginning of months. So they changed it around, and that became their first of the year, uh, Exodus 12, chapter 2. So stand with me and read Leviticus 23, 10 and 11, and then we'll go into our message. 23, 10, and 11. It says here, and speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give, you, give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, ye shall bring a sheaf of the firstfruits of your harvest unto the Lord. That means an offering. And he said, Wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. God bless us as we take a look in the book for a walk in the world. Lord, it's certainly hard to preach after the great choir today and the music. We are so blessed to be here to worship you in music. Lord, I just pray that you'll speak to hearts as your supernatural word has an effect on each and every one of us. Uh, we, we can talk about any subject from any book, but only one book truly convicts, and that's the supernatural word of God. Bless us as we dive in today and study this uh, for, for our Easter message. Bless now, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We will turn in a few moments to Deuteronomy. But they changed the month to the first month. You know, the word first in the Bible is a significant word. We know to us, uh, we, we understand the word first is a great word. Uh, we seek ye, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. We understand that if we put him first in our life, we have a blessed life. We think of the fact that we meet on the first day of the week, that we give our first fruits, as Proverbs 3, 9, and 10 says. That should be on the screen as well. It'll be on the next screen. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. 
God had given the Jews a wonderful promise, and we believe he promises the same promises to us as we give to him. But we know the first is, is very important to them. They were to give the first fruits of their giving, and the first of the month was important to them, the first month of the year. And we know the firstborn child was important to them. Their first fruits offering was important to them, very important. And during the feast, each person would bring their first fruits to the Lord. And then they would recite from Deuteronomy chapter 26, which we have in our Bibles, verses 5 through 10. So they'd bring this offering, their first fruits, and they'd give it to the priest. And then they would recite six verses of Scripture. They'd recite our, recite our passage today. And that's interesting what they did. And of course, again, all this points to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this would cause them to remember their past, their deliverance from bondage in Egypt. But of course, to us and to the believing Jew, they would realize this pointed ahead to the Messiah. And all this stuff fits together so nicely. And this was done, as I said, as a remembrance of the slavery in Egypt. Do you know when we give to the Lord, we ought to remember our deliverance from the bondage of sin? at Calvary. We ought to remember that. For God so loved the world that he gave. And so we give. And today I'm not going to preach on tithing, but giving of our first to the Lord. And we can make offerings today. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But we know every time we give to the Lord, we need to think about Calvary and what he did. Since AD 70, they no longer offer the offerings. They don't have a temple. They just have a time of prayer. But we know that in Deuteronomy chapter 26, we will learn about this feast. It says here in verse 2, Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 2, it says that thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall put it in the basket. So they were to bring this and place it in a basket, and that would certainly be pleasing to the Lord. Look now at verse 5. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father, and he went down to Egypt, this is referencing Jacob, and sojourned there with a few and became a mighty nation, a nation great and mighty and populous. I mean, Jacob went down there, and they didn't leave for 430 years. And they grew as a people. They grew so much it scared the Egyptians and they decided to put more burdens on them and try to control them even better than they did. And so they would bring their offering and they would read this, the importance of history to the Jew, to the history of their people would be read and that would cause them to remember the evil here in verse 6 the Egyptians evil that's a great word a Hebrew word that's translated in your Bible elsewhere broken broken you know sinners are broken people do you know that you're a broken person without Christ and we are trusting him for our salvation, and he saves us. And once we're saved, he starts to put our life back together. But I was a broken person. I love the song, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. I was broken. And God, when he saved me, began to put me back together. I love the little kid song. You know, it took him just a week to make the sun and the moon, but he's still working on me. You know, he has to deal with this old sinful body that I carry, and, and he has to magnify himself through this body. And, and I'm certain with me, it's not an easy task. But I was sinking deep in sin. I was a broken person. And they would read this down, down through uh, verse 10, drop down to verse 8. It says that, And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with great terribleness and that's another word in your bible that is translated elsewhere fear i mean these signs and wonders that goes on to say cause the egyptians to just really fear the lord and this was uh, important for them to recognize the greatness of god do you recognize the greatness of god in your life do you recognize the greatness of god in this universe our god is an awesome god i mean just look out at what he created, and you realize, wow, this is quite, quite awesome. 
I was talking this morning about an atheist that had trusted Christ by studying the uh, customs of sealing the tomb and this massive stone that was rolled before the tomb. He st uh, before the tomb, this massive stone. He was an atheist and he studied the seal and the stone, and certainly he knew about the guards. And his study as an atheist, he wanted to just dis disprove Christianity. And he came to the conclusion that God was real, you know, and he trusted in the Lord. And then he wrote a book about that, what he had discovered. You know, there's been so many people that say, well, God doesn't exist. Uh, God isn't real. And, and I, I'm always amazed at people, the Bible says the fool has said in their, their heart, there is no God. Why does the Bible say it's, he's a fool? Obvious. Look at creation. You know, it's amazing, we think of this building, I, I would not be stupid enough to get up here and say, wasn't it great, the explosion that put everything together in this building, uh, wasn't that wonderful? I mean, the dynamite blew up, and the materials went into place, and the wires went into the walls and the windows. That was so awesome. And yet, you'd say, well, you're an idiot, Pastor. It's obvious, the handiwork and the design. Do you know how much more complex the solar system is than this building? Do you know how much more complex your body is than this building? I mean, to think that it all happened by random chance. And you see, that's why they say, well, we need billions and billions of years because you throw all these materials up, it's not falling into a church. So we're going to keep throwing them up until finally it just fits just right. And we've got to keep throwing it. We need time, they say. And so they keep saying the earth is older and older. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, someone said it was a million years old. I had a teacher that had to teach evolution in the school I went to. I was in sixth grade, and my hand went up, and I said, Mrs. Ross, I said, I don't believe it, that it all happened by chance in a million years. I believe God created the world. Now, I was attending the, the Christian Reformed Church in Grand Haven at the time, and, and I had uh, believed in God, you know, I had knowledge. I didn't know the Lord personally yet, but I understood the concept of evolution, and I raised my hand. And she said, well, it took a million years, at least a million years for it to all happen. And then it became millions and millions and billions, and now, now they keep lengthening it because you just can't make it all happen. You just can't make it all happen. And as you read all the scriptures about scientific discoveries in the Bible, when you read Ecclesiastes, 40 scientific discoveries that were named and clearly described in scripture before mankind even figured it out. Think of how, how that Isaiah knew the world was round. You think of that. How Job knew the moon was just a reflector how the weather cycle, and all these things. And, and we want you to understand the handiwork of God. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. God is real. He created this place, and he created you. And you're here today not by accident. You think, well, I made the decision to get up and go to church, but God knew before you were born you'd be here today. He knew what I'd say. Whether it was good or bad or not much or whatever, God knew all about the message I'd preach. And he knows what's going on in your life, and the Spirit of God can speak to you this morning, knowing your heart. I don't know your heart. He does. He knows all about you. And so here, they would come to the priest, and they'd offer an offering. And in verse 9, at the, verse 8, we, we talked about the fear of the Egyptians had the great fear. And verse 9, and he brought us unto this place and gave us a land, even a land flowing with milk and honey. You see, they gave a first fruit offering because they appreciated all God did for them. That's why we're here today, because we are here not to show uh, how fancy we can dress. I got my Hamrick's $59 suit on. And uh, light suit, I'm always feel conspicuous wearing something so bright. But it's not about that. It's about worshiping him, recognizing who he is, the great Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus. And we lift him up this morning, and that brings God glory. You know, we lift up Jesus, and that makes God so happy. You know, we don't lift up the Holy Spirit. He's not given a name. He does a work, but he's the silent work of the Trinity that speaks to our hearts. And we don't have a service and praise the Holy Spirit. We have all of our services about praising the Lord Jesus. If I lift him up, 
I mean, he's going to draw them into himself. So we lift up Jesus that pleases the Father, and the Holy Spirit in our heart cries out about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I'm thankful for the Lord Jesus who saved me so many years ago. And as I knelt near my bed, and I was attending Okemos Baptist Church, and I got on my knees and prayed and received the Lord. And that was a, quite a summer. I had read through my New Testament in about every other week, I was down on my knees praying to receive the Lord again. You say, well, why'd you do that? Because I wasn't rooted and grounded in Scripture yet. And every time I'd make a mistake or sin, go to school, I'd have doubts, I'd get on my knees again. And someone discipled me, a guy with Camp's Crusade, Bill Kaiser, said, Dan, listen, you don't need to do that. You need to, you've already trusted him. What you need to do is confess your sin. And you need to read your Bible and read your Bible and study your Bible. And he instilled that in me as a young guy. And I haven't doubted in a long, long time because through Scripture, he's made himself very real to me. You want to see Jesus? He's the living Logos. He's the Word. When you get in this book, you'll get to know him very well. And so here they would offer this offering because they were grateful for all God had done. Now notice verse 10. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me, and thou hast set it before the Lord thy God, and worship before the Lord thy God. The word worship's an interesting word in Scripture. It's actually translated in places, bow down. When we worship the Lord, we bow down. When we worship the Lord, we give our first fruits. It's clear in the context. And as you study, Chronicles tells us worship involves reading Scripture, singing hymns, praising, giving. All these things are involved. That's why we come to church. We're here to lift him up, to praise him. You all know the great Hebrew word. I text someone this morning, hallelujah, he's risen. It's a great Hebrew word. It means praise the Lord, praise Jah, Jehovah. We praise him today. We lift him up because of all he's done for us. So here they, they were worshiping the Lord. They were given an offering. They were reverencing God. Now we go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the rest we'll have on the screen for you in a moment. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see the fulfillment the first fruits, we see that clearly as the New Testament makes it very clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 and 23. I love to see this unfold. I love to see things, the types, uh, the, the uh, symbols, the types in the Old Testament, and as, as the New Testament reveals and, and explains them further. I love that. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it says here, and this is Jesus, of course. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. The Messiah rose from the dead. And it says here, he rose from the dead uh, and uh, become the what? First fruits of them that slept. So that first fruit offering would look ahead to Jesus. Look at verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, Afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. So when he comes, and of course, we're raptured out of the ground, and I, I know I'm excited about that. I wish he'd come today. But he's the first fruits. What a fulfillment of that offering of the first fruits. He offered himself, and he wants us to recognize him. And then Colossians 1.15, we're not going to turn there, but it says he's the firstborn. He's the firstborn of creation, and I explained that several weeks ago. It just sort of uh, excited me, and I got up here and shared that ahead of time. But he's the firstborn, and, and that's a wonderful word. It's the old word protupos. He's the, the perfect type, the per perfect example of all the others who are going to be resurrected. Who, who else is going to be resurrected? We don't call the rapture a resurrection, but that's what it is. When he speaks, we'll come out of the grave the dead in Christ. But we won't have this old sinful body. Amen. I pick on myself, and I use myself sometimes as a bad example about impatient when driving. Someone said this morning, joked about road rage and looked at me. I don't have road rage, but I could get road rage. If people don't learn to drive right, I could get road rage. 
uh, but that's obviously my problem. But, but you know, we, we are not going to have this sinful body. We're not going to have this flesh. Flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to have a changed body like the body of Jesus Christ. Perfect, sinless. And so he was the type, the first fruits. Others were resurrected before him. So he's called the first. Why? Because his resurrection was different than Lazarus. Different than the widows of the Old Testament. Different in the New Testament resurrections because he rose as the perfect type. The perfection of Jesus Christ. Great fulfillment. Well, what about our offerings? Well, on the screen we're going to have a few verses. There's several offerings we can give besides our first fruits. As 1 Corinthians 15 says, Lay in store with God has prospered on the first day of the week. There are other offerings we can offer. One, we can offer our bodies. I love Romans chapter 12. It says here, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. We don't offer an animal anymore. Christ the lamb died once for all. The Jews had to go every year and offer a lamb. Jesus Christ came. He nailed those ordinances to the cross, and he fulfilled all of those Old Testament types. He's the lamb, the perfect lamb without spot and blemish. He was sinless. He never sinned. He's an impeccable Savior. Uh, He's the God-man. And so we can offer our bodies to him, present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. And that's our reasonable service. God doesn't ask anything of us that we couldn't handle. He doesn't even give us temptation that, that we can't handle. He gives us an escape. In fact, the devil's the one who tempts us, but God always makes a way of escape. When he tries us, he enables us because he's God. And he, he, we can offer our bodies. And, and you know, we, we think about baby dedications. People dedicate their baby. I think that's a good thing. We do that here. And I'm sure my parents dedicated me. In fact, I was, uh, had a little water poured on my head or sprinkled on my head when I was a baby as part of that dedication, and that's fine, but that's not baptism. Baptism needs to put under. And uh, I'm sure most of you were dedicated. But it, it doesn't end with the baby. Dedication is every Sunday, getting up Sunday morning and saying, it's for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. We're going to church this morning. I, I never asked my dad. I feared my dad. I was joking with somebody. My two brothers, older brothers and I, we all feared our dad. My dad was not abusive. But we knew my dad meant business. <laughs> you know, None of us got up Sunday morning and says, well, we, we want to share our opinion. We really don't want to go to church this morning. That didn't happen. We knew when we got up, we're going to church. My dad was committed to having us in the house of God. So baby dedications are wonderful, but what we do is start there and continue to dedicate our children to the Lord day in and day out for their entire existence under our roof. As long as I was living in my dad's house, it was the daily bread. At dinner time, on Sunday it was church, and usually at least one other time, they always went Sunday night, and uh, I started to love church and started to go Wednesdays and be with the college kids and learn to love the Word because my dad was consistent and steady and saying, as for our house, you know, we're going to church. We never, we never, so we were dedicated. We never questioned that. So we offer our bodies. And then in Hebrews 13, 15 on the screen, it says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. I love 1 Thessalonians. It talks about the attitude is what I call the attitude of gratitude making the choice to rejoice. You know, you can be a half-empty guy if you want, or you can be a half-full guy. That's not the greatest illustration, but you understand. So many times we can get negative and pessimistic about everything. And I, I, I struggle with that a little bit. I thought this morning, well, all the folks that come to the early service, we're not going to have them at the, you know, a lot of them won't come to the regular service. And I thought, you know, uh, you know, this is how you think. It's spring break and everybody's traveling. And you know, the Lord starts saying to me, what is wrong with you? I- I'm in control. That's not your church, Junior. That's my church. You know, this is the Lord's church, isn't it? It's not mine. It's not yours. I, years ago, I had 
a church I was at, and they had all these name plates, so all the people who gave a certain amount. If you gave a certain amount, you got your name on the pew. I hope we don't have any names on pews here. I'm not saying that's sinful, but it was just different for me to see all the names. And I thought, well, you know, and, and there are people who actually think, you know, when they sit in their place, this is my pew. Maybe they think, well, I paid for it, and I'm sitting here, and, and I'm not going to be moved. I don't know, but... You know, the pews belong to God. The first fruits belong to God. The pews do, the building does. We, none of this is ours, it's the Lord's. It's his church. And I have to be an under-shepherd to him because he's, he's, he's God. And so we, we have to learn to have a positive attitude of gratitude. So I prayed before I came here. I went in my restroom back there and prayed. And then someone else prayed with me, and I prayed, and, and I just and the Lord just kind of revived me and said, I'll have the people there who I'll have there, <laughs> you know. And, I, you know, you invite people, and you hope they come. They don't always show. But do you know God's sovereign? E even in you being here this morning, everything, God's sovereign in that. And so the praise of our lips, we have to have the attitude of gratitude. We have to have a good attitude and be encouraging to our families, not always negative. And then third of our cheerful giving, look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7 and 8. Every man, according as he has purposed in his heart, let him so give, not grudgingly. Oh, boy. Harold said the other night, I've never heard our pastor preach on tithing. I haven't been in Malachi. I hadn't been in Luke where he said now to the Pharisees, you need to learn to love and continue to tithe. I haven't been there. But here's a, a verse that is all about cheerful giving. And I'll say this, if you give because, oh, I've got to give my tithes, oh, ooh, I don't even want to go to church. i got to write out a check. Your whole spirit is wrong. Amen. Your, whole, your, your whole attitude is wrong. Look what it says here. It says, we don't give grudgingly or, or because we have to of a necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, that's an interesting word, cheerful. Um, my fridge broke. I wasn't cheerful when I wrote the checkout this week. Yesterday, a nice man came by, fixed it. Nice guy, did a good job. But I wasn't excited about writing him a check. And the water here is 19 years old and I got to replace that. I'm not excited about paying that bill. But I can be excited about giving to the Lord because it's fruitful. I mean, you've heard the great song when we were on the mission field the first time someone sang that song about, you know, giving. And I uh, used to teach my Sunday school and about giving and all that. And you get to heaven and maybe you'll meet someone that says, you know, you, you gave generously to a missionary and I got saved and I want to thank you. Now, I don't know if it's going to happen like that, but certainly that, that certainly goes along with reaping and sowing. And here it says, God loveth a what? Cheerful giver. And you know the Greek word because I've used it in the past. It's the word hilarion, our word hilarious. I don't know anybody. I haven't looked around this church during offering. I don't look to see if you give or don't, but I'm sure I looked around. I've never seen anybody that thought it was hilarious. <laughs> so maybe when we translate that, we wouldn't use the word hilarious because maybe that word was used back then a little differently, but you get the point, don't you? It's certainly not giving grudgingly or, oh, I've got to give. Oh, i got a church. Every time I go to church, the guy talks about giving. Well, you can't say that here. But this book talks a whole lot about giving. And God loved the world so much that he... I mean, hey, you, you can't outgive a God like that. And he says, look, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. I mean, there's no doubt that giving produces fruit and blessing in our lives. Now, I don't like, you, you know, I don't like the prosperity gospel. I don't like to tell evangelists the things they say. Some of them actually annoy me. I have to actually make sure I don't watch those Sunday morning because I don't want to get up here in the flesh <laughs> and preach, you know, about those guys. One guy continually says, I made a lot of millionaires. If you get to my ministry, you may become a millionaire. I thought, that's malarkey, as my dad would call it. Baloney, as my friend Ken would call it. It's baloney, it's malarkey, you know. It's like that preacher who preached 
a longhorn sermon. There was a point here, a point here, and a lot of bull in between. <laughs> Baloney or malarkey. But, you know, these guys preach this stuff, and I'm like, that context doesn't say it, and I go ballistic. So you don't want me watching that at 9 o'clock and coming here and preaching at 1030 because I'll get away from my text like I am right now. I haven't watched it in a while. But it's sad to see the, the Word of God twisted to someone's advantage. Scripture talks about preachers who preach for the almighty money, the almighty dollar. The dollar's ruined many families and many people, many, many churches. It's ruined a lot of people. It's a root of evil, of all evil. And so we have to realize that we, we make choices and we want to give to bless others. And I, I think about, you know, we were, I love um, the song, It Was Finished. It, we heard that this morning. And, and I love that Greek word. We get our word telescope from teleo. And of course, a telescope looks way out. And I mentioned this early. And uh, I, I thought about that. And I wrote down in my notes it means more than just accomplishing, uh, you know, our redemption on the cross. It actually means to carry it through. When Jesus Christ died, he paid for all the sins of the world, but he finished everything on Calvary. And what he did there uh, continues on and on and on and on. A sinner today can be saved because of what he did. The work he did is still going. It didn't end on Calvary. He paid, he shed his blood, and that's finished. But the, the word means to keep going on and on as far as you can see. Isn't that something? You take a telescope, you look out there, and you really, you can see a ways, but you think, boy, these people, they have these Hubble telescopes, they can see way further. I would love to be able to see all the universe and see the handiwork of God, see all the planets and things. I'd love to just go and, and visit one of these massive telescopes and just look and just, wow, praise God. Look at his creation. But what he did, the work he did on Calvary doesn't end with Calvary. It continues to go on and on and on. And we think of the resurrection story, and we have to talk about Peter, and we did a little this morning. We're not going to say the same things, but I love Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. It talks about, no, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way with sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. And when you find Peter's three denials, he's doing those very three things. <laughs> he's walking, standing, and seating with the wrong kind of people. And Peter, of course, you know the rest of the story. Peter was broken. Jesus looked at him in Matthew's account, and Peter went out and wept bitterly. And that doesn't mean he had a moment of tears. It means he broke down in agony and wept and wept. He had seen the life of Jesus. He knew Jesus was the Messiah. But when difficulty came, he denied him. And he didn't just deny him once. He denied him three times after bragging. We talk about the three, do you love me, that Jesus confronted him three times. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Feed ten shepherd, feed my sheep. And we know he put Peter on the spot to remind him of his denials. You know what? There's been times as a young man I've done the same thing. You say, well, you're a pastor today, I know. I was in middle school one time, and the cutest girl in middle school came to my church. And I thought, Wow. She's a Christian. She's going to be my wife. Can't remember her name, but you know, that's how you think when you're in middle school. The next day at school, everybody was teasing me. You're a holy roller. So-and-so went to your church and said, you're a religious guy. Come to find out she wasn't a believer. And I said, no, 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 I'm not. I go to church because my mom and dad make me, and I, I basically denied the Lord. And from the age of 12 to 19, I was a coward, a compromiser. I didn't dare stand up and say I'm a Christian. I tried to hide my fear with playing sports and doing other things. At 19, <clears throat> the Lord got a hold of me, and I said, I'm not going to be a compromiser anymore. I told you this story. And I decided I was going to live for God. And I told my friends, I'm not hanging around you anymore. I'm not doing those things anymore. And that caused my best friend to get saved. Why, I finally, finally had the courage to be a Daniel 
And I was named Daniel. You know, we can talk about Peter, but there are times in our life where we've had opportunity to witness and we just don't. And I'm not saying we shove the gospel down people's throats, but, but worse than that is to be apathetic and never say anything about the Lord. So here's Peter. Talk about hope. How do you think Peter felt at this time in his life? Like the lady when I was preaching so hard against abortion as a young pastor in my 30s in Okinawa, a big church, and I was just really impressed with myself. And a lady came forward afterwards sobbing. She said, I've had an abortion. Will God ever forgive me? And I felt that big. Because my preaching didn't bring about hope. All I did was preach the other side of that, the condemnation, the judgment of God. And I realized I missed the best half of that sermon. It's like people, we talk about church discipline, which we will do here if necessary. But we don't want to forget 2 Corinthians, which is all about restoration. You know what? There's hope for you no matter what you've done. You say, Brother Dan, I've had a terrible past. I've made huge mistakes. There's hope in Jesus Christ. There was hope for Peter. You know, a guy who is a believer, but he's just down and out. Thomas, who doubted, had to see the Lord. He must have been embarrassed when the Lord said, Thomas. In Mark, our account today, where the Lord upbraided them because they didn't believe Mary and Mary Magdalene. Well, who's going to believe Mary and Mary Magdalene? Mary, I mean, she's a good mother, John and James, Zebedee's wife. She's a good lady, but she's just a woman. And Mary Magdalene, she had been possessed by seven demons. And, you know, we don't take the word of women. That, that was not biblical. It was Jewish society at that time. They didn't consider it worthy. And, and so Mary Magdalene and them, they come out of the tomb. They tell Peter and John. They tell others along the way. And they get to the upper room. They tell everybody. And they don't believe them. But I think of the hope for Mary Magdalene. I just can't imagine what it's like Sister Joy, I, I just can't imagine what it's like to have been possessed by seven demons and then to be gloriously saved. I just, I mean, you know, for her, the transformation in her life, I mean, it's mind-boggling. Controlled by seven demons and then Jesus saves her. Can you imagine that? I love that song. I'm not against all new songs. Some preachers are. I can only imagine. I love that song. I can only imagine what it was like for Mary Magdalene to have experienced redemption, regeneration. I mean, that just floats my boat. That stirs my motor. I mean, that's, that's, that's to think about that. All oh, she was bound and bound and bound, and the Lord delivered her from all that. The hope she must have had but here now, she's on the way to the tomb. It's darkness. They set out. And it's, I said this morning, it's a mission of the heart, not of the mind, because on their way, they're saying, well, what are they going to do about that stone? Mark calls it a mega stone, a massive stone. <laughs> Matthew said it was an earthquake and an angel moved it. John uses a great word, a word that means he simply tossed it away. So they're, they're not really thinking clearly. They're excited. They want to anoint the Lord they love because they don't want him to stink. He's been dead a few days, and they're bringing spices, and they're going to do this last thing to let the Lord know they love him. And Mary Magdalene certainly was down as the disciples were down in hiding. She had been there at the cross and the burial. Now she's at the resurrection, she and Mary. And, and Mary Magdalene is no doubt down, but can you imagine it? when she arrives and that angel says you're looking for Jesus he's not here he's alive he's risen from the dead and I just can't imagine the thrill that came over Mary Magdalene oh what a thrill that would have been and now all her hope was gone but it's all alive because he's alive and because he lives I can face tomorrow Let's sing that, Harold. Lead us in that.